Hey, so today I want to talk about a seriously underrated piece of Roman history. Uh, this is a coin issued by Brutus, the assassin of Julius Caesar. And it's not the most famous coin, and it doesn't feature the most famous person, but it's something that I think actually helps us really unlock a lot of what it is that lies behind Brutus's decision to assassinate Julius Caesar. Uh, and it also allows us to see why it was that the arguments that uh, people raised about Brutus supposedly needing or desiring to assassinate Caesar resonated so heavily. So I want to start by just sort of pointing to um, this coin. This is the most famous, probably the most famous coin from all of Roman history. It's a coin issued by Brutus uh, at the phase or during the phase when he's fighting a civil war against the heir of Julius Caesar, Octavian, and his allies, Antony and Lepidus. Uh, and this is a coin that's that's justly famous because it celebrates the murder of Caesar on uh, March 15th, 44 BC. So the coin itself is pretty self-explanatory. The front of the coin, or the obverse, has a picture of Brutus, and it says Brutus, B-R-U-T, Imp, Imperator, uh, and then it has the name of the uh, moneyer who issues it, um, Pladius Cestius. The reverse of the coin, though, is what's most interesting. Uh, you see Eid Mar, that stands for the Ides of March, the 15th of March, and then you see two daggers and a cap. Now, the two daggers represent, of course, the daggers used to stab and kill Caesar on March 15th. The cap might be a little more mysterious, but this is what's called a Phrygian cap that's used to symbolize the freedom when it's given to a slave. So when a slave is, is liberated, they're given a Phrygian cap, and that symbolizes that they're no longer enslaved. They are now free. Uh, so Brutus's use of the Phrygian cap on this coin indicates quite clearly that on the Ides of March, those two daggers were used to kill Caesar and bring liberation or freedom to the Roman state. So this is a, a super famous coin because, of course, the front of it shows Brutus and the back shows Brutus being extremely proud of what he believed the assassination of Caesar brought about. Um, now, Brutus himself is an interesting figure because, of course, we know him as Brutus. And Brutus um, is a descendant, a direct descendant of the person who is responsible for the foundation of the Roman Republic. This is Lucius Junius Brutus. Uh, and you see here a statue that for a long time was thought to be that Brutus, the founder of the Roman Republic. Now it's actually understood to be probably somebody else. Uh, but Brutus very much is an ancestor of that particular man, of that Brutus. And so when Brutus, the assassin of Caesar in the first century B.C., makes his public debut, it's pretty natural that he would associate himself with that Brutus. Now, the, the way that Brutus makes his debut in the 50s BC is a way that's kind of conventional for people trying to make a name in public. He is one of the three moneyers, or people who are responsible for the design of Roman coins, and in particular, Roman denarii at that particular moment in time. And this is a, a really important thing because denarii are distributed as payment to soldiers. So if you're responsible for issuing the coins that are distributed as payment to soldiers, you have the opportunity to believe and to begin your political career by illustrating something very important about yourself. So the images and the words that you choose to display on those coins have a great deal to do with how you want people in the Roman world to perceive you and to understand what you as a politician will represent for them um, if you are elected to higher office. And so this coin is on some level pretty natural for what Brutus would represent. Uh, the front of the coin has a picture of Libertas, the goddess of freedom or the goddess of liberty, and along the side it says Libertas. So it's pretty clear what he's saying there, right? The front of the coin is saying he stands for liberty. The back of the coin shows Brutus. This is the Brutus who established the Roman Republic, and you see him marching with lictors. Um, this represents Brutus's first consulship, uh, the Roman office, the supreme Roman office of the Roman Republic, and it's a position that Brutus occupies following the deposition of the last Roman king, Tarquinius Superbus. Those people carrying, um, the lictors are carrying a staff and rods, and this symbolizes the power that Brutus as consul has. So it's totally natural that one of the coins that Brutus was issued um, in the first century BC when he came into this office of moneyer is a coin that advertises his family's commitment to liberty and his particular association with the Brutus who founded the Roman Republic. 
But this isn't the only coin that Brutus issues in 54 BC. So this coin is also issued in 54 BC by Marcus Junius Brutus. And it's a coin that advertises a different aspect of his family history. So in the front of the coin, again, on the obverse, we have a picture of Brutus, the founder of the Republic. And next to him is the word Brutus. So this is a pretty clear evocation of the same Brutus and the same ideals that we saw advertised in the first uh, denarius that he issued in 54. The other side of the coin, though, is a little more mysterious for those of us who are not particularly well steeped in the intricacies of Roman Republican history, because the figure here is much less famous to modern audiences than Brutus, the founder of the Republic. This is a man named Servilius Ahala. So who is Ahala? Well, the story of Ahala is uh, one that's buried kind of deep in our sources that talk about the early Roman Republic. So the story of Ahala is something that we see appear in uh, the 450s. And our author, the best author for this, is Dionysius of Halicarnassus, a Greek uh, writing much after this time, who nonetheless represents and records the uh, ideals that the Roman Republic advocated and the stories that it told about its earliest heroes. So this is a moment in the 450s when a famine breaks out in the city of Rome. And during this time, a figure who is not particularly well placed, but is particularly uh, aggressive and ambitious. Um, this is a man named Spurius Maelius. He decides to take advantage of this situation. Now, Spurius Maelius was rich. Um, he was rich in his own uh, in his own right, but he had also taken over the estate of his father. But because of his youth and because of his status in Roman society, he couldn't hold office or any other public um, official position, despite the fact that he was as brilliant as anybody in Roman warfare and decorated with as many prizes for valor as anyone could imagine. And so because he had resources and he had a good name and he had a lot of money, he thought that this famine was a good time for him to aim at overthrowing a social order that had made it difficult for him to excel. And so he decided to, in the words of Dionysius of Halicarnassus, aim at tyranny and try to curry favor with regular people. So we're told that Maelius had a lot of friends and a lot of clients, and he sent them around in a whole bunch of different directions, giving them money from his own resources so that they could buy food. And he himself went to, to, to Terenia to buy food. And in a short time, through his own efforts and those of his friends, he was able to buy and bring into Rome a large portion of grain that he distributed among his fellow citizens. Maelius did this, but the people running the Roman state, the patricians, who were the old aristocracy in Rome, they didn't do anything of the sort. And so Maelius did a great deal to alleviate the famine, while the people who are actually responsible for running the Roman Republic did very little. And so Maelius then asked the people to weigh his own achievements against the actions of the patricians and to note how greatly, how utterly they differed from one another. For the patricians, Maelius said, uh, saw nothing and gave nothing from their private fortunes to help regular people. But Maelius had taken his own resources and he had used this to assist the needy. And when he used up all the resources that he personally had, he took loans out just so that he could continue to give food and support to people, to his fellow citizens, at a time when they were starving to death. So Dionysius of Alicarnassus says, those who allied with him were continually calling him the savior and the father and the founder of the fatherland. And they declared that it would be uh, not even enough to give him consular power because of the greatness of the things that he had done. In the Senate, patricians became very concerned because what they realized is Maelius had done a great job in building support for a position that might overthrow senatorial power. And so one of the older senators made a motion to immediately put Maelius to death without a trial because they were convinced that he was going to overthrow the state. And they appointed for this task a man named Servilius, who was a young man and brave in action. Servilius, they say, took his dagger under his arm, and he approached Maelius as he was proceeding from the forum. And Servilius came up to him and said that he wished to speak to him about a private matter of great importance. So Maelius then ordered those who were close to him to withdraw a little bit of a distance. Uh, and when they did, Servilius, having gotten him separated from his bodyguard, took out his sword and plunged it into Maelius's throat. 
And then after doing this, he ran to the Senate House, where the senators were still in session. And he showed the sword that was dripping with blood, and he shouted to those who pursued him that he destroyed the tyrant at the command of the Senate. And so because of this deed, they say that the cognomen Allah, or Ahala, was given to him, insomuch as he had under his sword, uh, his, insomuch as he had his sword under his armpit when he came upon Malleus. For the Romans call the armpit Allah. So now we come back to Brutus, the assassin of Caesar, and we look at these coins in 54. The first coin, of course, we explained why this is important. It's liberty and it's Brutus, the uh, figure who brings liberty to the Roman state. This is something we can identify with. It's something we can understand. And it's a story that we already know. But what about the second coin? Well, the second coin is in some ways, I think, much more interesting in understanding why Brutus did what he did when he assassinated Caesar. Because Brutus, yes, is connected to the Brutus who established liberty and established the Roman Republic, but he's also a descendant of Ahala, Servilius Ahala. Uh, and Ahala is the person who used violence to take down a tyrant when that tyrant was looking to overthrow the Roman Republic. He did it because of liberty. But the violence and the use of violence to take down an aspiring tyrant is much more closely associated with Ahala than it is with the Brutus who founded the Republic. And so when Brutus, 10 years after issuing these coins, orchestrates and is involved in the plot to murder Julius Caesar, he's inspired at that moment, not by Brutus who liberated the state, but by Ahala, who used violence to destroy a tyrant. 